they will expel you from the synagogues. Yes, the hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering worship to God. Words taken from the Holy Gospel today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we shall consider the complete opposition of the world against the Church. Many are the worldlings who preach tolerance, who believe the liberal lie that each man should be able to judge for himself what is good and evil, and that the government should preserve men's freedom to choose to do evil things, should give them that false freedom to believe in lies, to worship falsely, to abandon their marriages, to poison themselves, and to mutilate their bodies, simply because it seems good to them at the time, and in our twisted understanding of freedom, does not appear to violate the rights of someone else. They worship tolerance. The pagan Romans were actually quite similar. They would permit just about any religion to be held and held publicly so long as they did not contradict the worship of the state, as long as they agreed to get along with everyone else. Whereas Catholicism is the only true religion, not Judaism, not Protestantism, nothing else but Catholic Christianity. And this, the, those tolerant pagans could not bear just like they can't bear it today. And so, literally, for centuries, Roman Catholics died in defense of the one true faith, died because they refused to recognize that any other religion was good or true or saving, and anything but evil. Here are but three examples out of hundreds, thousands, from St. Alphonsus' Victories of the Martyrs. There is a bishop, St. Sabinus, who was commanded by a pagan governor to adore a small idol of Jove, Jupiter. But the saint, animated with holy zeal, dashed the idol to the earth and broke it to pieces. The pagan, exasperated at this insult offered to his idol, caused both the hands of the saint to be instantly cut off. Persisting in the faith, he was then martyred. Consider St. Eulalia, a 12-year-old girl, went out from her hiding place in the countryside to the nearby city to defy the governor to his face. She rebuked him for worshiping the devil, proclaimed herself a Christian. She spat in the face of the judge, threw down the idols, trampled upon the flower which had been provided for an offering. The judge, thereupon, commanded the executioners to torture her. They lacerated her entire body with leaded scourges, poured boiling oil over her wounds, and applied burning torches to her sides and breasts. She, however, bore all of this without uttering a word except to bless the Lord and return him thanks. The tyrant enraged at the constancy of the young virgin, ordered that her flesh should be torn off with iron hooks until the bones should be laid bare. The saint then, with uplifted eyes, exclaimed, Behold, my Savior, these wounds make me believe that I am destined to be thy spouse. Do thou of thy mercy render me worthy to be so. Finally, the tyrant, perceiving that nothing could weaken her constancy, determined to burn her alive, where she was smothered by the flames. Finally, consider a Saint Romanus, who would not stop preaching the true faith and condemning the false ones. So the pagans ordered a surgeon to pull out his tongue. A torrent of blood poured forth, covered his beard and his breast. It was a miracle that Romanus survived this torment at all. 
But the greater miracle was that he continued to speak. The great church historian Eusebius writes that there were many people living in his own time who witnessed this. The pagans were incredulous, called in another surgeon, second opinion, to examine him, and verified that he had no tongue. He was thrown into prison for a number of months, and during the entire time, he continued to preach the glories of Jesus Christ and the one true faith with more vigor and zeal than he ever had before. Call to your mind the boldness of these saints casting down those idols, speaking boldly, offending people, and ask yourselves if these saints came and visited our country, how would they be treated? They would be rebuked. But by whom would they be rebuked? They would be rebuked by the lukewarm Christians, by the worldlings. There are not wanting any number of lukewarm worldly Christians who make a pretense of the faith. They claim to believe in Christ, to belong to his church, but they wish to be friends with the world as well. The lukewarm Christian doesn't like conflict. He doesn't want to seem judgmental, doesn't want to alienate people, make people angry. He has his beliefs as if they were a personal preference, like his taste in food or his favorite sports team. Which is ironic, because the worldlings are usually quite dogmatic about things like sports, which don't matter anything. The worldling loves the world and it loves him back because he belongs to the world and not to Christ. Who is the worldling? The nominal Christian who does not recognize that every single non-Catholic religion is false and does not save and that people are wrong to believe the lies, the lies of false religions. They are wrong to worship their false gods or to pretend to be Christian without being Catholic, without confessing their sins to a priest, without worshiping in the true form of worship, the most holy sacrifice of the Mass. The worldling acts just like the pagans. He is indistinguishable from them. He is never going to be picked up and accused of being a Christian and martyred. He keeps their company. He speaks their language. He dresses like them, or she dresses like them. He jokes with them, shares his life with them. The worldling thinks it is a virtue to have homosexual friends, to have Protestant friends, Jewish or Muslim friends, to invite these people over to his house, to let his children play with their children, who sends his children to their atheistic schools to be taught that there is no one true faith, there is no one true God, but only at these atheistic schools, public schools, to believe in the city of man and the exaltation of that evil freedom, that freedom to choose evil. He thinks that people should have a right to worship as they think best, that they should have a right, have a right to marry who or what they like, to live as they please, even if it is in direct contradiction to the commands of the good God that he pretends to love. He pretends. The worldling is not a servant of the one true God. He will not listen to God's commands given through his one true church. He will not obey the commands he finds difficult. And so he actually does not know or love God. He wishes to be saved, of course. He wishes to be loved by God. He wishes to go to heaven. He do does not wish to serve God alone. Rather, he is quick and eager to lay down his faith or any expression of it for but the smallest token of appreciation from the world or out of fear from the smallest dislike that it threatens him with. 
Somebody unliked me on Facebook. What would St. Sabinus, St. Romana, St. Eulalia say to this, to the challenges that our faith faces today, to the way these world things act? What is our answer? This. You, good Christians, have found the one true faith, or rather, you have let yourself be found by God. You have let yourself be claimed by God as his own. You belong to the one true good God. And what is more, you adhere to the most perfect expression of that faith, the traditional Mass. For as you know, once upon a time, worldly men thought that the traditional Mass was too Catholic, that it had too many references to sacrifice, to the priesthood, to sin, death, and judgment. They said it had too many references to Mary, mediatrix of all grace. All these things, they said, were obstacles to Protestants. And indeed they were. Just like the truth is an obstacle to those who wish to live in darkness and error and sin. And so, they cut these things out of the Mass in a vain attempt to make the Catholic faith more appealing and less offensive to non-Catholics. Great job. Really worked out well for you. What would our martyrs say to this? St. Romanus, who spoke after his tongue was ripped out of his mouth, Perhaps this fact would make him speechless, incredulous, that threatened with no tortures, threatened not even with the loss of property, but only the loss or the anticipated loss of popularity, that for this, men who profess themselves to be Christians would so easily betray their faith. Would he not rebuke these worldlings, these faithless, lukewarm Catholics? I tell you, he would have harsher words for these than he ever had for the pagans. At least the pagans believed in what they had been taught by their parents. What excuse has these worldlings? They're little better than apostates. So what shall we do? No more half measures. If you find yourself trying to take a middle way, give it up. Try not to be too Catholic or things like that. Get over it. Make a choice. You're Catholic or you're not. Be full-on Catholic. Be 100%. Be full-on traditional. Embrace every teaching of the Church, all the prayers, all the sermons of the saints that threaten hell and damnation, for those who fail to embrace the true faith or fail to live in accord with it. Embrace our Catholic music, Gregorian chant, sacred polyphony. Embrace these to the full. Conform yourself entirely to the ways of Christ, to the ways of the Church. Do not dress, even, as the worldlings do. Do not think it good for women to dress like men, for men to act like women. When someone says to you, Oh, we don't do that anymore. We don't believe that anymore. You tell them, you are wrong. We are Catholics. We are heirs to the great martyrs of old. If it suited them who died gruesome deaths for the faith, it suits me too. We believe everything we've always believed, and we shall act and dress accordingly for church, for life. We shall not wear immodest fashions. We shall not use your modest language, laugh at your impure jokes. We shall not think it good to mix with pagans or to let our children be poisoned by adulterers who live together without being married. We shall not let our children go to your house filled with your pagan idols, free access to immodest things online, blasphemous TV shows, movies that undermine the one true faith and insult the one good God. We serve God alone. We belong to Him alone. We are Catholic. 
You serve the world and belong to it, so you can have it. You will perish with it unless you turn and belong to Christ. Take courage. Women, everyone, enough of feminism. Cast it off entirely. It has robbed you of peace of soul. Stop the pursuit of what the world says the women should be. Embrace what the church says women should be. Men, give up effeminacy. Stand up straight. Speak boldly, firmly. Govern your houses, govern your eyes and your bodies first. Any Catholic who does not live his faith conforms himself to the world. Who conforms himself to the world in order not to give offense gives great scandal instead. For he encourages those worldlings to think that they are right, to think that they are okay. He makes evil look good. He is silent in the face of error. Let us close with these chilling words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Woe to the world because of scandals. Woe to that man by whom the scandal cometh. If thy hand or thy foot scandalize thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to go into life maimed or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For he that shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of him when he shall come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.